Jacob Ryan Smith, composer and entertainer and performer, is our guest on Personally Speaking. Stay with us, please. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and actor, singer, and composer Jacob Ryan Smith joins me now. Jacob received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Musical Theater Performance from the University of Michigan. In 2020, he accomplished a year-long project he entitled The Songsmith, where he wrote and produced a song every day for a year. In performance, Jacob has been doing regional theater all around the country for years. He's here with us today to talk about his life, his career, why he loves creating, the values that mean the most to him. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, Jacob Ryan Smith. Before we talk to Jacob Ryan, though, let's let's listen to some of his creation. I can't believe how much she missed her. Our guest is a composer and performer, Jacob Ryan Smith. And first of all, let's begin with that name. Are you one of many Jacob Ryans in the family, or is it an original name just for you? And why did they pick it? Totally original name. It was my uh, my uncle who passed right before I was born. So in the, the Jewish faith, uh, my mom's Jewish, my dad's Catholic. So okay. I've always been sort of mentored with both mentalities. <laughs> um, but uh, the concept is if someone passes without children, if you name your child after them, it's like carrying on their lineage a little bit. So my right. great uncle, Jacob. Yeah. Okay. And then Ryan just sounded good, apparently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you don't want to be just the Jacob Smith. It's cool to have three names. No doubt about it. And stuff. Now, I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like it. I'm, I'm going to go back to James Patrick Lasanti. You know, let me ask you, because okay, you flows. talk about your dad having an influence so much on your life. And I want to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. What did he see in you that made him say, you know, I, your father loved music and he was talented, but he saw in you something that he wanted to encourage and, and bring along. What did he see? And unusually, why is it that your father was prompted to encourage you to take that path? My uh, my dad loves music, has always loved music his entire life and spent kind of the his whole time in his life where I was developing my musical skill, skills doing the same thing. Right. Um, ended up going to like summer camps for it, developing it, wanting to be a concert pianist, and then eventually just going in a different, more academic direction with his life. Okay. Um, and so I started picking up a, a crazy musical passion when I was like two years old, just humming to myself, banging on the family piano, <laughs> kind of just a constant addiction to sound and noise. Uh, and I think he saw that really early and was like, okay, if I can cultivate it in him and make him feel, you know, good about it and supported and like he has lifelines that will allow him to explore this to the 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 finest degree that he can explore it, he might actually end up doing it in a way that I was never able to. And that's exactly how it happened. And now he sort of lives vicariously through everything I do, which is very cool. Isn't that so? He took something that might have made other parents nervous and made it creative and artistic. We had a, one of those Olympic winners from the uh, gymnastics team on the show. And I said, how'd you get into it? And he said, you know, I was jumping around the, the furniture and being crazy in the house and they direct, decided to direct it by putting me into gymnastics and ended up being an <laughs> Olympic champion. So same thing, you're a, a champion of a different sort. Now let's go back because I was intrigued by what uh, Jacob said in the beginning. Um, now on Long Island and around New York, I, I celebrate Catholic Jewish weddings all the time. But years ago, it was a little more challenging for people. When your parents got married, did they ever tell you, did they face many challenges or was it widely accepted? Um, they they definitely faced challenges um, familially when they first mm. got together. So my dad is from, you know, a very large Catholic family from um, right in the city of Atlanta. My mom is from like 
very, very small kind of, um, you know, off crossroads town in the off skirts of Georgia called Waycross okay. um, and was the only Jewish person in town. So lived a very <laughs> specific oh. life there. They ended up meeting in school far later in their life and just hit it off, became best friends and sort of went with that. But there were a lot of family tensions. I mean, especially at that point, my, my parents are a little older. They had me when they were 40. So it, the, the, the mentalities were just really difficult when it came to the generation above them and that sort of acceptance. But I mean, they, they had always stuck to it and knew exactly what they wanted and sort of had a, you're going to deal with it attitude to everyone wow. in their life. Yeah. Having you at 42, I'm taken aback by that a little bit, you know, <laughs> oh, trust me, I am every day and they, <laughs> they could not act younger. Those two have more energy than I could possibly describe. See, now I lie about it. My, my mom's 102. When I tell people that they say, well, then how old are you? And I say, well, she had me at 70. You know, I, they don't buy it. But I, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you, too. Do they what do they do with you? Like, uh, I'll tell you what we do now. Uh, we have a welcoming ceremony where uh, there's a priest and a rabbi present for both the wedding and the baby. But back then, probably not so much. Like, did they decide to leave you open ended? Did they direct you in both paths or one or the other? You know, I, I specifically, like I had a bar mitzvah, I went to synagogue growing up, like the, the Jewish path was a little bit more where I leaned mm -hmm. onto, but the family as a whole, I think because there were so many different, you know, spiritual, religious backgrounds happening under one household, it kind of evened it out a little bit where spiritualism was a, a part of the household. It was something that was discussed. It was definitely okay. something that was ingrained in how we lived, but it wasn't like a specific practice became the mm -hmm. set of rules or the bar none. I think open-mindedness towards any sort of different background became integral in just how we sort of talked about religion in our household. Okay. And did dad celebrate Christmas still? We still celebrated Christmas every year, but we okay. also did Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. My dad right, would right. go to Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. My mom would sometimes go to Easter. Like it was, it was that sort of unanimous relationship of them deciding like, we're going to do this together and we're going to celebrate what matters to us, basically. That's that's really good. So it's a, a, truly an ecumenical family. And, you know, we're always saying that we are a Judeo-Catholic, Judeo-Christian people, and you're the walking embodiment of two people from different traditions and cultures, but who came together to form and create one great kid, right? <laughs> I sure <laughs> hope so. Man, do I hope so. Please let them know that. <laughs> we're, we're talking here with composer... <laughs> Jacob Brian Smith. Now let's talk about that. 2020, you decide that you're going to write a song every day uh, and you get 366 songs, one a day. And I'm, I'm interested in this. This was also during the pandemic. And first I want yeah. to ask you, for so many creative people, when the world shut down, uh, it was uh, striking and, and stunning for them. You use the time to creatively put out a song every day. What was your first reaction to the world closing down? Um. <laughs> Uh, so I was in my senior year of school when it happened. So it was okay. it was this funny space of the project existing as everything was shutting down before our eyes. Of I started on January first, so okay. not knowing at all what the year was going to grab. And in my mentality, it would just sort of act as like a running diary. So um, on the day that <laughs> school got canceled, the first press releases came out. They called it a pandemic and everything. I'm pretty sure the song we came out with, and I'll censor myself, was called um, the, <laughs> the World Has Gone to S-Word. <laughs> um, and I think that was just me and my friend sitting there being like, we don't uh, have any idea what's going on. Yeah, but we, yeah. we have to keep making a little bit. And I, I had made this promise to myself to work on this this project for the entire year and at that point we were in march so you know i was already getting close to 100 songs and i was like at this point i can't stop it and all right. of a sudden i have all the time in the world to work on it <laughs> right. why not instead of you know falling apart and being depressed like use this as my outlet to continue to spend my days doing something um and it became so much bigger than i could have expected it to be yeah now, you know, for a lot of us who absolutely love music and we listen to it all the time, but uh, we and we may even sing it, but for most of us, we have no idea how someone actually creates a song. Is it is it divinely inspired? Does it come from above? Does it just pop into your head? You play around on the piano until you find notes that seem to work. How does anyone, specifically you, create a song? Okay, you want to know the big dirty secret that yeah. no one tells you? <laughs> Tell me. It's it's so easy. Uh, and and not just because I have a background in music. I think mm -hmm. I hear I talk to a lot of young songwriters about this too or just people who are interested in it, but the the concept of writing a song comes very much from just where your brain goes. 
we hear people who are not quote unquote musical humming all the time, whether mm -hmm. it be a song they know, whether it be just like singing notes, doing random stuff. If I pointed at you and I said, make up a melody, you might be flustered and put on the spot, but you'd be like, ba bum 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 ba da da ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba like random notes. And right. all of a sudden, if you take that little thing I just did and just happen to have the facilities to be able to musically like know where on a piano they are, what key signature you're in, where it might sit, all of a sudden that ba da 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 ba da ba da, that's a song. And you mm -hmm. just continue it forward. I mean, most of my writing I do on walks, humming to myself. And if there's something that gets stuck in my head, I'm like, okay, well, clearly that that's a jam. Like, let's go see what that is. So it, okay. it comes a lot less down, at least for me specifically, to like crafting the notes on the page and figuring out like harmonically exactly right, what right. I need it to be. It's it, if it comes that easily, it's going to come that easily to anybody who hears it too. And all of okay. a sudden you have a hit. Now, let me ask you, though, someone even as great as uh, George Harrison of the Beatles, you know, <laughs> ear earworms get into us and, and we may think it's ours, but actually we picked it up along the way from other people. He, 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 my sweet Lord, he got sued for because at least the beginning of it sounds very much like a group that had uh, performed the song earlier. Mm -hmm. How do you know what's mine versus what's just in my head because I heard it on the radio? That, you know, an eternal debate and one that I think I can understand anybody's perspective on. Mm -hmm. Mine mine is a little bit more loosey-goosey. I mean, okay. in the broad, you know, if you're talking about diatonic music, which is a lot and most of like popular Americanized music that we listen to, mm -hmm. you got eight notes to work with. Right. And then 12 if you add our, our little tones. No one's using semitones. So at a certain point, there's only so many patterns that you can make from that playlist i think a lot of it comes from orchestration a lot of it comes from the story you're telling in your lyrics a lot of it comes from build momentum the the instrumentation you use i think that's what gives a song its identity and so a lot of times i i, I hear about lawsuits happening of people being like well that sounds like the melody to my song and i'm like it, it, yeah yeah i mean i could <laughs> probably name like seven other songs that sound like the melody to your song and eight of them that came before you wrote your song like right I think it comes down to subjectiveness and I, it, obviously plagiarism is a very real thing, but music's a very difficult space in order to yeah, point yeah. at something and be like, that is plagiarized. And I'm a big fan of illusions and working off of what came before you, you know? Okay. No, no. I, I have many rabbi friends and cancer friends. And one of my rabbis, I said to, uh, I said, look, you, you said something last time we were doing a wedding together and I liked it. So I stole it and I used it in a homily of mine. And he said, Jim, not only in religion, but in all walks of life, we borrow, we we steal. We there's nothing new under the yeah. sun. And and I want is that true? Like when you create a song, is it uniquely, wonderfully for the first time it's ever been played in the universe, or is that even possible? I don't think it's I don't think it's possible at all. I think we're okay. built up of everything we've seen before us. Every yeah. song I write, I I even hope at a certain extent that you can point at it and be like, oh, that's in. The lineage of blank like that is okay. that is the experience that you learned from doing this or working on this piece or listening and appreciating this piece like i think there's such a beauty in that because it shows our history and it creates a, a nowness that is just as interesting and doesn't take away from how new it feels just because there are relationships to things that came before it if that makes any sense. It makes great sense. Jacob Ryan Smith, yeah. a great composer and performer is our guest. But I got to ask you, I've seen, especially at 54 Below, some people sing your stuff. Here's what I'm wondering. Um, many actors say, you know, I, I love a director who guides me but does not tell me how to perform. In the same way, when you watch someone take what you created, your baby, and they sing it with their interpretation, is it is it is it a happy thing or is it a frustrating thing that you know how you meant it to be sung and they sing mm -hmm. it the way they sing? Do you try to tell people how to sing it or do you leave it open to the possibility that their interpretation is a new perspective on your song? A thousand percent that one. I okay. love hearing them. I, I, um, I'm I, not the smartest person in the room uh, <laughs> ever, 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 ever in no situation. <laughs> like I'm, I'm very proud of what I know and the way I design music and stuff like that, but I can only take it so far. Yeah. And the, the joy of art is the collaboration that allows someone else to be like, well, on my body, in my voice, in the instrument that I have that, you know, is the conduit for this music in this moment, here are the things that I think I can offer unto it. And those are things that I could have never in a million years imagined when I'm sitting here alone banging on my piano here, you know? 
So I'm a yeah. huge fan of letting artists control things and push towards the way that they want to do it. If I'm in the room, you know, it might be collaborative and we might talk about specific writing choices. But I think if anyone ever sung any of it, whatever they feel is golden is mm -hmm. golden to them. Whether it's my favorite decision in the world, I don't think it necessarily matters. Like it is artistry to them at that point. Going back to the whole experience of growing up in a, a spiritual home, do you specifically, have you specifically ever written a spiritual song for spiritual purpose? Not really, if I'm being honest. I, I wrote a lot of choir work when I was growing up because um, mm -hmm. I, I sang in my school choir. We did ensemble and acapella and we had, you know, Renaissance Baroque choir and stuff like that. So it was a huge inspiration going into like my original efforts into figuring out arrangement and mm -hmm. orchestration and stuff like that. But no, my my personal writing interests have never fully wavered unto the spiritual unless there's a, a specific character in a work that the spiritual feels very important to, you know? Yeah. I really, I always deem it most important to write for the character rather than my own sensibilities. Jacob Ryan Smith, sorry, yes, I don't know if you intend to, maybe you may even be one for all I know, but to be a, a, a dad someday, to be a parent. But I ask that in this context, when we look back at our family of origin, which is I think for most of us, powerfully important. When you look back at the way your parents raised you, and someday maybe you're going to be a parent yourself, but what did they do right in raising you, Jacob? Um, uh, freedom. A, a huge amount of freedom to make my own mistakes and also come to them for the things that I knew I couldn't handle. So there was always, a, don't get me wrong, I made a million and a half mistakes growing up, <laughs> but I think there was always a a... Uh, a firm but judgment-free zone that mm -hmm. always was felt in the house that no matter how ashamed I was of something or embarrassed or something like that, my parents never came at it with hostility or punishment first. Punishment eventually came, but <laughs> the first <laughs> impulse was always, okay, like, why? Why, mm -hmm. why did we do this? What was the mindset? What was the sensibility? What can we not do next time? Why is this a trend or a habit? Mm -hmm. And I think opening up that freedom to make mistakes without the fear of like judgment coming down onto me allowed yeah. me to set my own moral code that didn't feel like it was in the shoes of someone else, which okay. I think is where it gets so difficult when it feels like your parents write a moral code unto you. And then later on in life, you have to be like, well, is that my moral code or is that what mm -hmm. I was told to do? Yeah. You probably know this about yourself, Jacob, but you're a highly, highly articulate guy. And are, are they articulate in the same way? Oh, yes. Oh, my okay. gosh. No one can talk like my father can talk. <laughs> that man knows how to use his words. <laughs> okay. So that's interesting. Yeah. So in many ways, you reflect them. I wanted to ask you, too, when you deal in a world like the arts, um, many, many parents will uh, be happy that their children go into the creative fields as an avocation. Um, but, but I ask this more often of people who are strictly into acting. So much of the arts community says, you know, I don't know where my next check is coming from. I don't know where my next job is coming from. When you go into the creative arts, you are taking this incredible leap of faith that I can somehow or another make a living out of this in a world where very mm -hmm. often people don't. Your parents' response to you choosing a creative path, was there any advice to say, look, get a real job and you can always do some music on the side? Um, my parents definitely put me through a line of tests Okay. Without a doubt, like there are specific programs and specific people they wanted to have see me perform. Like they they had a sneaking suspicion that I was good at this. I had a sneaking suspicion, but like, you know, in any uh, bubble that you grow up in, it's very hard to compare your own abilities to a mass scale, you know? Mm -hmm. oh, and then it, it, that's the only way to know if there's an actual future to be had in it. So a lot of programs, a lot of summer camps, a lot of things like that that allowed that... A, I'm so lucky to have been able to be a part of because they really like fine tuned my passion for this and allowed yeah. it to like cultivate in a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. um, but also gave me confidence because in a lot of the places I got, I excelled, which was a really amazing thing. And as more and more successes started happening, my parents sort of were able to look and be like, okay, I mean, we can't, we don't want to stop it. This is, this is going in the right momentum this is clearly mm -hmm. something that he's good at that other people are encouraging him to do. Who are we to not do the same? And okay. so I think they, yeah, that positive reinforcement really allowed them to take a step back and be like, okay, we don't know much about this path, but walk it. 
figure it out, see what it is to you. Uh, composer Jacob Ryan Smith is our guest. Jacob, we had, uh, and I'm forgetting his name at the moment, the fellow who wrote uh, If Then and many other Broadway oh, musicals. Oh, Tom Kitt. Yeah, yeah, we had him on a yes. couple of times. And great guy, but recently one of his shows that opened up, I was, uh, for better or worse, reading one of the reviews and it was not very positive. And I guess I wonder, when you are creative and you put it out there, whether it be uh, what you write, what you do in terms of your performing, you know and I know that there are going to be people who reject what you create or critics who put you down for it. How much do you let the critical word get to you or do you even read it? And and what what are you supposed to do with negative criticism if you're a creative person who doesn't want to be, you know, thrown a wet blanket but wants to continue yeah. to create? Um, it's a hard one. I, I definitely do read it. My ego is not strong enough to completely like <laughs> separate the two. Yeah. But what what I do think I'm pretty good at is there's um, I've been thinking a lot about art and quote unquote good art lately mm -hmm. and trying to define what that means. Like, is it something you enjoy? Is it something that's entertaining? Is it something that's beautiful? Like that that term good is so ethereal. It doesn't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. And I think I've settled on a space that if your art accomplished what you set out to accomplish, it's good. It okay. doesn't mean some. it's enjoyable, it doesn't mean it's fun, but what did you try to do? And I think a lot of finishing art and receiving criticism comes down to you as the creator or the artist or even just a, a piece of the cog on a gigantic project, like looking at your specific work, hmm. how much effort you put into it and saying, did I accomplish what I set out to do? And just to, if that's not loved, that's not loved. And is it loved by me? Am I proud of it? okay. And I've got a life to live and a million other things to write. And I'm going to get someone on my side, man. Do I right, promise right. you that eventually, <laughs> you know, it might not be this one. Um, but I think that's the fun of experimentation. If it was all funneling into trying to make everybody love everything, it'd be a very yeah. commercial and I think dull artistic life, life you live. <laughs> right. I think, I think annoying some people or doing things that some people don't get, that's mm -hmm. the only way you, you grow your art to be able to make that magnum opus one day. There's an actor, Adam Cantor, and he was on last month with us, and he said uh, he never reads reviews, and apparently he's getting some good ones for uh, starring in The Inheritance in Los Angeles. But mm -hmm. he said, if I if I read them, and I, I love hearing the good stuff, then I've also got to take seriously the negative stuff. And you, you're saying, no, I, I'm open to the criticism, hoping, of course, it's going to be positive, but open even to the negative is a, a learning experience as well. Now, let's go to something else here. Uh, people comparing creative genius, because I think you know, you, you have genius in you to be able to create this new and wonderful world of music. But like we had Stephen uh, Schwartz on and I was saying, well, Stephen, mm -hmm. Stephen Schwartz on, I love his stuff. And they said, well, he's he's good, but he, he's, he's not Sondheim, you know. And I'm like, wait a second, there's different ways <laughs> of being great and genius and stuff. Do you compare yourself with others? And is that a safe road to take? Uh, uh, yes, I do. And no, it is not. <laughs> I think it's the best. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to, especially when you're seeing these great, you know, I'm, I'm a very young composer and I, I'm yeah. very, very lucky that I've had a lot of success and opportunity yeah. to the point that I am, but I'm officially in a field where I guess my, my competition, which is mm. a crazy word to use that I think is the false word, but are these greats? Are the Steven Schwartzes, are the Jason Robert Browns, are the Tom Kitts, yeah. are the Duncan Sheiks, are the Janine Tesoris? Like they're the sort of the caliber that their work is being performed on is what I'm aspiring to get my work to, right? So it's hard not to compare and be like, wow, you inspired my childhood. You made me want to be an artist. These melodies are, you know, eternal. It feels like the way you shape words are incredible. How could I try to compare myself to you in real time? And the answer is I just simply shouldn't ever. Right, right. <laughs> but right. it's it, it, it's a hard thing to not do. Um, and I think a lot of freedom can be found in those moments of being like, they are their work and there was a time where they were intimidated by those who came before them yeah. and have come into their own and have had the fortune and the opportunity and the backing and support to have created what they created. And if I can hopefully inspire a younger person the same way they did for me, that's the win condition, you know? And then at that yeah. point, I'm just as successful in like my heart, you know? For our uh, listeners on Sirius XM or for those who watch on YouTube, um, what you would have picked up 
listening to Jacob Ryan Smith is a uh, high energy, a lot of a uh, dynamism, a lot of charisma. And if you go on YouTube and you see him perform there uh, again, he kind of bounces off the walls with uh, amazing energy and stuff. All of which leads me, Jacob, to ask you, um, a lot of people listening to or watching a program like ours say, well, I'm so glad he's happy and upbeat, but I find it hard to get up every day. And, and sadness and depression can get to a lot of people. Are you always upbeat? And and if not, how do you bring yourself in the low moments back up to the happiness that you so easily reflect right now? <laughs> um, no, by, by no <laughs> stretch of the imagination am I always upbeat. Um, I'm lucky. I'm really lucky that I'm, I, I get to do the things that I love every day. And I, Mm -hmm. and I really, really try not to take that for granted. And I don't always do a great job. There's a lot of days where there's some contract work or Mm -hmm. song that needs to be written. And I'm sitting here being like, what am I doing alone in this room writing (laughs) music? Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to the little things, the little joys. And Mm -hmm. I, that's always been a big thing for me of finding those when i am down those immediate things that center me that make me feel better so like i'm a huge cold brew drinker potentially unhealthily so but i (laughs) i do know that if i'm in a funk there is a space of like having that coffee next to me holding the warm drink hearing or uh, the cold drink sorry hearing the ice like hitting the side of the cup the seeing the condensation ring on the side of like my workstation those little things make it feel grounded like i'm not stuck like i i am choosing something for joy mm-hmm. and that sounds so small but i have literally lists and lists of things that i've written down being like these are your little joys yeah. find one of them whenever there's a bad moment yeah. um yeah for our listeners and watchers uh, who might want to know more about you your music the things you create uh, where do they go to find out more about jacob ryan smith uh, you can check me out on my website, jacobrsmith.com, or okay. on any sort of social media at Jake Smith Sings. Okay. Jacob yeah. Ryan Smith, thank you so much for being on Personally Speaking. You are exactly what I thought you'd be, full of life, <laughs> energy, insight, and uh, and a joy. Whether you know it or not, you you come across as a joyful person. And, and boy, we need more of that in this this world that we're living in today. So thank you so much for everything you shared, and, and much good luck to you. And we'll be listening to Jacob Ryan for a long, long time, because I think he's got so much in him to share with so many, and he uplifts the spirit by his creative, wonderful gift. So thank you for sharing that gift with us. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you need to contact me, you can reach me at personally speaking podcast at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Asante. We're also now on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer. Personally speaking, our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.